it's, I'm not writing a program now. I'm just going to write a piece of uh, what I'm writing over there. I'm supposed to, uh, I would have written it over here. I don't want to take the camera out. So, so let's say we have a function, some kind of a function, OK? And this function accepts some kind of a argument, whatever, OK? So it receives 2, 5, 9, 10, something. I don't know, A, B, C, D. But let's say this value that I'm passing to it belongs to series of things that I can pass through it, not everything. So, um, and they are sequential, so, which means uh, I know all the list of things that I can pass to this one. There may be unlimited stuff, but sequential. Let's say like integer numbers. I know it starts from, if it's positive integer numbers, it starts from 0 or 1 and goes up to infinity. So I can, uh, I know the list of things that I can pass through this one. Now, assume that for the first value that I can add to it, whatever it is, let's call it n1, the first value that I can pass to it, let's say this works correctly. <coughs> okay, so let's assume correctly. I cannot write correct correctly. Okay. So we are assuming, so if it's, if n that I have over here, for example, can be from 1 to infinity, if I pass 1 to f, I know f is supposed to do its work and it's going to do its work properly. Okay? Are we okay? Now, Let's call it x. I'm going to call it x because I'm going to use n and stuff again one more time. So, but now, assume that knowing the fact, okay, assume fa that, that knowing the fact that f, my function, that accepts xn, which means the nth element of the thing. So this is x1. This is the first element xn is a, the nth element. If assuming that, knowing that fn is OK, it means works correctly, I can prove and I can come up with the conclusion that because xn is correct, then I can come up with the conclusion that n plus 1 is correct too, which means from F20 being correct, I can come up with the conclusion that F21 is correct too. If I can prove that, then this function F will work perfectly for anything. Why? Because from 1, I can conclude that 2 works correctly. From 2, I can conclude that 3 comes correctly. And that's an endless loop. It goes all the way to the end. Are we okay with this? All right. This is a very logical thing to say. Now, let's say I want to find the factorial of numbers, OK? Uh, you know what factorial of numbers are, right? It's 1 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 3 by 4 by 5 by 6, and it keeps going up, right? So I want to find the factorial of a number. So I'm going to say over here, um, in fact, and I want to find the factorial of n, OK? And I don't want to go in factorial 0 being 1. Forget about that, OK? Let's say we start from 1, OK? So what is factorial of 1? It's 1, right? So I'm going to say if n is 1, then return 1. Are we OK with that? Right? Now I'm going to say, wait a minute. What is factorial of 20? It's factorial of, of 19 multiplied by 20, correct? Right? So in here, I'm going to say, if it's not 1, return the factorial of n minus 1 multiplied by n. Whoops, what the heck? Yes. Yeah, but it's using, well, I said f, it's fact. Okay, so if you look at this, it follows the exact same rule that I just mentioned to you. 
assuming that from the last one, I can conclude that the next one has a correct result, and the first one is a correct result, then it's going to work perfectly for all of them without any loop or anything. It's kind of like magic. OK? Are we OK with this? So like, and, and I can run this, and you'll see the answer is right. I don't want to actually go through it and execute and compile and stuff. Uh, but run it at home, and you'll see it's going to be OK. Give me two seconds. Now, having said that, let's take a look at something more nuts and complicated which is essentially this guy. Where is it? The Hanoi Towers that I was talking about. This game is to move the disks from the first pole to the second pole. The rule is that I, you, I move only one disk at a time. And I'm not allowed to put, and I'm not allowed to put any bigger one on the smaller one. One way is to actually sit and think how we're going to solve this. Another way is to try to apply the same rules that I was talking about. Let's assume somebody can move the n minus one correctly. Let's assume that somebody is going to come and help us to move n minus 1, which means the top three, for me correctly. If that's the case, then how can I solve this? All I need to do, if that's the case, all I need to do <clears throat> is to ask that person to move those three to the third pole. Now, I know how to move one, correct? I'm going to move that one to the middle. And I'm going to ask the same person to move n minus 1 back to b, and problem is solved. But behind the scene, what I don't know is this. So essentially, when I ask the person to move the first three, it's going to be actually this happening. And then I move 1, and then I ask the person to move it again. That person is going to do this, whoops, to move the rest, right? How? How is this thing possible? It's through the magic of mathematics. This is actually called mathematical induction, which is essentially if I can apply that rule that I just mentioned in English, not using math mathematical stuff, if I, if I could actually do that, what I would do is this. So, so in, uh, forget about this factorial. I'm going to create the Hanoi Tower. So, Void Hanoi, OK? So that's me. So I need to, to move n disks from one pole to another. So I want to move from tower A to tower B using tower C, right? That's what I want to do, correct? Now I'm saying, OK, if I have only one disk, then problem is solved. I do not need to worry about anything. All I need to do is, all I need to do is, essentially, I'm going to actually write what the movement is. All I'm going to do is move from tower A to tower B, and I'm done, right? If it's only one disk, problem is solved. But if it's more than one disk, then I'm going to ask my friend, the person who knows how to fix this. Who is that person? That's me. I'm going to say, call the Hanoi for n minus 1. So I'm going to say, call myself n minus 1 to move from tower A to tower C. Remember, we first move it through tower B. Now that everything is moved, Right? Now that everything is moved, why is it giving me a, oh, why am I putting it in main? Sorry. Else. <laughs> why am I putting it in main? Else, yeah. So if that's not one, then call myself 
to move the top three from A to C, right? Correct? All right, through B. Now that everything is moved from A to C, what I need to do is to move that single one from A to B, right? So I'll do it, and that's exactly the same movement. So I'm going to say, move it, OK? Now that single one is moved, I'm going to ask myself again to move the n minus 1 that I just moved to, to C to move it from C to B through A. Right? Problem solved. Magic. And it works. So if I actually run this program, if I actually say over here Hanoi, and I had four of them, right? So four disks from tower A to tower B through tower C. And if I run this program three years later, you will see it actually puts the exact same rules over here one by one. You want me to bring that one up or go at home with three coins, four coins, and do this. Don't do anything. Just follow what it says. Move A to say A to B. If you put all those things, you will see that it actually does the movement for you. Now, how does it work? It's through the magic of recursion, which means it calls itself over and over. And because we just applied those rules that we mentioned, so essentially we applied the, the mathematical induction rule to anything, uh, to this one, it will work perfectly. And it's the exact same thing for anything. So what happened is that long time ago in some uh, uh, school, they, 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 um, they taught computer programming to children, but they didn't teach them any loops. They just went directly to recursion. They didn't know anything, anything as loop exists, actually. They actually taught them this. And they would write any, everything in recursion. If they would give them loops, they wouldn't understand how to do it. OK? Recursion exists in reality, in every way. And everything that you see is recursive, is happening by copying itself. Look at a tree. If you take a branch, it's another tree, small one, right? You take another branch, it's a small one. Anything is made up of itself, OK? And that's what recursion is. The problem with recursion is, it, like, I can, actually, like, I can actually go through that factorial thing and walk through it and do it at home. Go through it and walk through it. Every time that the function is called, a new version of the function is called, which means when this Hanoi Tower is called, the first time that is called, you have to open up a function called Hanoi 1 and pass the variables to it and do whatever it says. The second one is called, it's not the old one. It's a new one, and every single variable is a new one. So it essentially pushes all the information of that function into a stack and builds new ones and starts working with that. And as soon as another one is called, then pushes that one to a stack. So essentially, it, it's like a, uh, um, a spring that you keep turning it, and when you let it go, it turns back in reverse order. That's what happens. So essentially, the first one is called second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And as soon as the last one comes out, it goes back to fifth one. And when it's called, it goes back to fourth. It goes back to third. It goes back to second. It goes back to first. It goes back to out of first, and program ends. I don't want to walk through it. It is your data structure's responsibility. So when you go to data structure, uh, this is what they're going to teach you, algorithms, how to write all these beautiful stuff. And there is only one problem with this. Because the function keeps calling itself to do its work, because the function keeps calling itself to do its work, sometimes for an action to happen, a function has to call itself millions of times. And because of that, the stack that it pushes the things in that stack gets filled in. It overflows, and it can't run it anymore. So essentially, the OS says, I don't have enough memory to remember how many functions you called. So I give up. 
just for your information, every simple, single compiler that you see is a recursive algorithm. And that's actually how it goes through the grammar of your code to see if the syntax is right. Because every syntax is made up of a smaller syntax inside of it. So it essentially breaks itself down and keeps going in, and it comes back so everything gets tested properly. OK? So every single program of yours is a, is a collection of smaller programs inside, right? Until you go to a single instruction. And that's how the compilers actually compile your code. Hopefully, after this, you go to university, you go to compiler design course, then you know what I'm talking about, OK, when you write your first compiler, OK? So that's the problem with recursive algorithms. They make coding very short. As you see, it's a very short little program that I have written that solves such a complex thing. If you, would, if you have written that thing using loops, and you can, go Google. Uh, Hanoi Towers uh, solution without recursion. And they're going to tell, show you're going to see exactly what the code is and you'll find out. OK? So it's, uh, yeah, so uh, it is expensive. And you just need to know that if you come to a part that you are writing a recursive algorithm, be aware of it. Always try to calculate and see what the depth of recursion is. And if it goes a little too high, it means now you have to switch back to something that is not recursive. So that's recursion. Yes? The exit condition is here. Because it keeps calling itself, it keeps on calling itself up to the point that all this n over here reaches to 1. As soon as it reaches to 1, it exits from 1 to this one and to this one, and it. So, so the exit condition for every, the exit condition for every recursion happens last. Remember, though. so you run, run, it runs, 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 and as soon as it gets to the end, that's the exit condition. When it reaches the exit, everything falls back on itself and comes back to the. Anyways, oh, and by the way, if you want to know, like, if I wanted to know how many movements I need to do to actually solve this. Now we know how to do it. We can use it using a static uh, integer value. So I'm going to set that one to 1. Then in here, I'm going to say a++. So what happens over here, every move that it does, it adds one to that static integer. And because that static integer is a shared integer between all instances of recursion, it, that's the only thing that doesn't get duplicated. So if this thing gets called 50 times, you're going to have 50 Ns, 50 TAs, 50 TBs, 50 TCs, and only one A. That A gets shared between all of them. So when we actually run this program, now you'll see that for uh, uh, four of them, I need 15 movements. And let's make it eight and see how many movements I need for that. Two hundred and fifty-five movements. Okay, and it's going to take a long time. So, and if yeah, and if I make it sixteen, then you're going to see what happens, right? I don't know. It's it's a it's a long process, right? It's going to take a while to go through it, but it's going to go through it and solve it. So, if you have nothing to do and you have a very boring life, put sixteen this together and follow the thing and see how many times. <laughs> <laughs> See if you can actually do it. But it's, it's solvable. It takes a while. Pardon me? Pardon me? It's not factorial. It's actually doing the Hanoi Towers for you. Factorial, factorial, I think the biggest thing you can do is fit 70 or 80. After then, that, it, just, it just boom. It, it can't do it. Anyways. So, yeah, so that's that one. I, it, it took a little too long. I'm going to stop it. OK. Yes? Uh, 
I don't know. That's the thing. That's the, that is, that's the thing about recursion. You don't need to worry about it. It's, uh, it's correct. <laughs> because that, it gets solved that way. Oh, by the way, every single chess, every single chess program that you see, it's written. It's recursion. <laughs> All right, so that's that. Now, now that we are done with recursion, let's uh, talk about exception handling. I talked about exception handling. I told you exception handling essentially controlling exceptional stuff that are going to happen through your program. Exceptional stuff that are supposed to happen to your program. These are errors that are happening through program through throwing objects and catching them at the end of the program. Okay? I don't know if you actually went through the the codes that we have did we have done in class. But I have done the int validation thingy that we have done with exception handling, and I'm going to tell you how it's done. I'm going to bring it up uh, and show it to you and uh, so you can see uh, what the difference is. So it is uh, let me bring it up. That's the one, eight, 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 and eight. I should have paused. Let me pause. First of all, let me tell you what syntax of exception is. When you are doing exception handling, the very first thing that you're going to do is you're going to be quiet so the prof doesn't have to shout when, you're, when he's talking. That's the first thing you need to do when you do exception handling. The se second thing you do is this. So let me just show you a very simple thing. In exception handling, you throw stuff. Okay? In exception handling, you throw stuff. And you catch them in a catchphrase and you try what is being thrown. Let me tell you, let me demonstrate, okay? Let's say I have a, a function, so I'm gonna call that function foo, and in here I'm, put, I'm gonna put n, so I'm passing an integer to this one, and I'm gonna say if n is one, I'm gonna say throw, hello. Else, if n is 2, I'm going to say throw 5. Oh, sorry, 2. Else, I'm going to say throw 5.5. 5. 5. Okay? Now, if I want to write a program for this, so I'm just going to write a loop that starts from 1 and goes to 3, and we'll see what happens. So in here, or 0 to, to 2, if I, uh, whatever. So I'm going to say integer i, and I'm going to say 4, i set to 0, i less than 2, or i less than 3, and i plus plus. Okay? Now, in, I'm going to put the whole thing over here in a try statement. And in try, I'm going to say try the foo passing i to it. And in here, catch a double d, catch a, an integer a. and catch a character pointer. I said catch and I wrote char. Catch a character pointer message. OK? Let me take this for loop out so I can repeat the whole thing over and over. Okay, so, 
So this is happening over and over three times. In here, I'm going to say C out D. And for heaven's sake, I don't want to throw anybody out of class in third semester because they're talking. And you're going to be embarrassed if I do that. And I'm going to get pissed at the end of the day if I do that. So please. OK? All right. So see what happens over here. This is essentially what a catch, a throw and catch looks like in exception handling. There is a function or object or whatever that throws an exception. Whatever it throws, it's going to be caught in a try statement. Now, in here, if, so if I do something like this, if I say over here, see out, hello, see out, I am here. This will never get executed if foo doesn't complete without an exception. So let's actually add that. So in here, I'm going to say, uh, let's put 0. And in here, I'm going to put 4. And I'm going to say else if 3. Else if n equals to 3. Now, if I do something like this, <clears throat> so for 1 or 2 or 3, foo is going to actually throw an exception, right? Otherwise, see out, no exception here. Nothing here. Nothing here. Now see what happens over here. If I run this program, oh my goodness, it went through all my, just a second. Uh, I have two mains. Exclude. Sorry, I added the other ones. Let me exclude from project. Now it should be OK, I think. OK, so let's put, let's put this one here. All right, so now i is 0. It goes to foo. Because it's 0, none of these things is happening, right? It comes out and says nothing here, and comes out, says, I am here, right? And then goes out. The second one, it goes in, i is 1, correct? Because it's 1, it goes over here, and it throws hello. When it's throwing hello, what is the type of hello? It's character pointer, correct? So it jumps on handled exception because it's a constant character pointer. I should have written over here const character pointer. Where is it? It didn't match the type. One more time. But anyways, that's actually a good example. If that was actually a beautiful example. If it didn't catch the exception, what happens? Exception will go run loose. It will go out of so it will the so this throw with an exception, right? That exception wasn't handled, correct? Catch this catch didn't handle it, this catch didn't handle it, this catch didn't handle it. Where does it go? It goes out of main to operating system and the operating system stops it. OK? So let's do it one more time. Yeah, so it comes over here. The first one says, I'm here. And the second one jumps to here directly without this. So because it threw an exception, and it was this one, everything got skipped and jumped right to the catch. And in here actually said, hello. You see that? Now the second one that's being called, it comes over here and it throws an integer. So the catch with integer will catch it and will throw five. OK? Now it goes up. This time it throws a double. And when it throws a double, double will catch it and it says 5.5 and it goes up. You see what happened? All right, so this is how exceptions work. Um, so essentially, a function throws an object, and you have to catch the object at the other side. Are we OK with this? Now, <clears throat> to use this to handle exceptions in a, in a program, let me just get out of here, remove, and add the other one. 
I changed my validation. Now take a look at my validation class. I created a class. First of all, there is a class called exception. There is a uh, library, uh, header file called exception. In that exception, <clears throat> mother of all exceptions is designed and uh, is created. That is called exception. And many other exceptions are inherited out of that one. Okay? But I want to create my own thing. So I create a class, inherit a class called bad int exception out of the class exception. I created the message over there, call it integer, invalid integer number. And I created a, a method called what. What actually is a virtual function inside exception. And it's supposed to return what's wrong. OK? So you see it says no pointer assignment, segmentation fault. Those are the values the function what returned. OK? One is memory, whatever exception, and the other one is no pointer assignment exception. All right? So that's, is, that is what? That, that's all inherited from exception? Yeah. So this, I, I inherited this one for exception. And I added the function what over here. And my what method, my what method returns the C string of message. That's what it does. And it's a virtual thing, right? Therefore, for the rest of them, which is too young exception, remember we created a bar? And in that bar, the guy had the, 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 the age was lower than certain thing, and we say you're too young. I created a uh, an exception called too young exception. The other one is too old exception. And last one is bad mark exception. And bad mark is a child of bad int. You see that? Now I have series of error messages that I can actually create. My hierarchy is that I have exception, Bad integer, bad mark. That's one hierarchy. The other one, exception, uh, too young exception from bad integer, and too old exception from bad integer. So these are all children of bad integer. Now, when I want to write my code that actually accepts an integer, my validation is now a reference. You see that? It's not because I, in this design, I'm saying an integer must have a validation. Without validation, it doesn't exist. But if we go to the exception in here into the validation, when validation is happening, oh, where is the validation? When validation is happening, that is right down here, my operator does not return a Boolean anymore. And it's a functor, right? The other one returned it. So this one is not returning a Boolean, which means it's not going to return true false. Instead, it's going to throw an exception, which means <clears throat> if I go to my validation, it's going to say, if it is less than 19, throw too young exception. If it is greater than 100, throw old exception. If it's less than 0 or greater than 100, throw bad mark exception. And my get int by itself, if it cannot read the integer, it throws bad int exception. Now, if you look at my program, the program does not deal with error messages anymore. What it does with uh, uh, the business logic in here does not care how the validation is happening. It says, enter your age and get the age. It doesn't tell if, if age is this, do that, do this. It doesn't care. After that try statement, it deals with all the problems that may happen, which means if it's too young, show the message and do whatever. If it's too old, show the message and do something. If it's bad integer, show the message. So the error handling part becomes separated from my business logic. If I had so many stages to do, so first I want to get the age, and the next step will be actually selling the drink, 
The selling the drink would come immediately after getting the age. I wouldn't deal with to see if it's wrong or right. Why? Because if anything goes wrong, it's going to jump to exception and go to the error handling part. Therefore, the process will become more clear. Many of the applications out there are written this way, which means you write all the stuff that you need to happen if everything happens correctly, back to back, and you don't worry about what's going to go wrong. Why? Because each process throws the proper exception if something goes wrong. So you write the good scenario in your business logic. When you're done, you go to the catch part. Now you see, what am I going to do if something goes wrong? Now I'm going to write all the catches to deal with bad stuff. Therefore, your business logic and your error handling logic become two separate things. Many companies, many groups, many uh, communities don't believe in this. They still go back to their own returning bullion, and they think that's the good way. So there is no, this is the way, and that's not the way type of a thing. That's why in C++, if you, hand, if, if you do new, if you write integer A is equal to new 5,000, and 5,000 integer, int 5,000, if you don't do anything, it goes like old times, which means if it cannot handle the error, if it, can, if, it, if it cannot handle the memory allocation, it sets your pointer to null. So you say, if the pointer is null, not enough memory. Correct? But if you include new at the top, then it won't set it to null anymore. It will actually throw an exception. And then you have to go down there and say, catch bad alloc exception, which is bad memory allocation exception. You can list all the uh, exceptions in C++. Just Google it, and it comes up. The things that may go wrong, and you can use it, the standard exceptions. And if there is anything else that you want to handle, that's the way. Create your own exceptions and inherit it from uh, the exception that we have. Also, there is another thing at the end that you can add. That is this, catch. This means if an exception happens and I didn't handle it, come over here. OK? And as you see, when I was doing my exception handling over here, what did I do? I said, OK, if it's too young, do this. Too old, do that. Bad integer, do this. Exception, do this, right? And in exception, it means this is exception happening that I did not handle. It's another exception from system, from C++ library. Because E is mother of all exceptions, that's why it is uh, ordered in this way. If I put this catch at the beginning, then that's the most stupid thing to do. Because the most general exception is at the top, right? And because that's mother of all exceptions, it's going to catch all the exceptions. It's exactly the game that I told you. I'm going to throw a ball. The first row, volleyball. The second row, basketball. The, sec the third row, soccer ball. The last row, any type of ball. So if I throw a rugby ball, the first three rows are going to just ignore it, and the last row is going to catch it. But if I bring catch any ball to the beginning of the row, then the other ones are not going to catch anything. Because I throw any ball, it's going to all catch it at the beginning. So again, the most general type of exception always sits at the end to make sure that it happens in an orderly fashion. And if anything is missed, then that's what you do. So essentially, now this is fine. And if there is any other exception that I want to catch, I can put the three dots at the end. And even for that one, I'm going to say, OK, if something happens wrong over there that I did not catch, catch it, show me what it is, and say critical error terminating the program. And I'm going to say exit minus 1. Exit minus 1 is essentially a return statement from main. I could have said over there return minus 1. It's the same thing. Exit, but the difference is that exit exits the program anywhere. If you run that in any part of your functions in your program, it terminates the whole program. So if something critical happens in your program, deep inside your logic, and you want to end your program right at that moment, exit minus 1 is what you or exit the code, the error code. 
because that one is what is going to get returned to the operating system, which is in this case minus one. Are we okay with this? And that's an exception handling. Yes, sir. Pardon me? Uh huh. Oh, that's Val Valgrind is a completely different beast. That actually, what it does, it actually takes over the exec. It replicates the operating system. So it becomes an OS that is running your program, and therefore monitoring every single thing. So it gives you the memory. Your program uses it and behind the scene checks all the things that OS is checking. And if something goes wrong, instead of just crashing your program, it tells you what is wrong with it before you actually give it to the OS. Valgrind is a completely different beast. Okay? Are we okay with this? Yes? What's the difference about the dot, dot, dot and this one? Okay, dot, dot, this is the exception. This is the general exception in C++ standard library. If there is any other exception that it is not handling, that's going to catch. So there's some exception. Don't be, don't, don't on this one, right? The answer is that really I don't know. Okay. okay? The answer is I don't know. Because we have the three dots, I would assume that's the case. Okay? Like, like just take a look at this. Just give me a second. These are the ones. You see that? These are the exceptions that we have. Logic error, invalid argument, domain error, log yada, 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 yada. This is C++ level. So, if it was before C++, this was an exception that C++, that was a thing that we didn't handle. Okay? This is C++ 17, this is C++ 20, like ambiguous local time. Okay? So, as you see, many exceptions may happen that the language doesn't, doesn't support, and that's the three dots for you. Okay? All right? So, again, you can go over here and take a look at it and see exactly what we have. Okay? So these are the list of all the exceptions that we have in C++. Any other question? We're okay? All right. Let me stop the recording.